I am from Ocean Township, New Jersey. That's where I was raised, but I was born in Asbury Park. My brother Tommy, named after my father, is three years younger than me. Me and Tommy, like this. Absolutely, Wendy and I are truly best friends at the moment, up to the minute, we're best friends. When Wendy was a child growing up, there were times when I would say, you're talking too much, you're talking too loud, and you're talking too fast. Wanda's the gold standard, Tommy is the boy. And out of the three of us, I was the eyeball out. Yeah, my family is very late to my party. Wendy came along in my life at a time that she knew, and everyone else knew that I needed some sunshine. And Wendy was my ray of sunshine from the day that she was born. And it was a fun house. It was a fun family. We had fun. We had, like, a lot of laughs, a lot of jokes. We were a jokester family, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> Presenting the perfect package, I learned that from my parents, the Williams family. We love each other. We dress well. We live well. We speak well. We're educated. We love our parents. We love each other. The perfect package, when in actuality, behind the scenes, nobody's perfect. I just found it easier just to go along with this perfect package, only to one day rip the face off of it and reveal the imperfections. Wendy was bigger than the other children in her class. Wendy was overweight. Oh, yes, yes. And she knew it. Yes. Wendy has worked on her weight all through the years. She's had problems dealing with her weight. and But now, look at her. She has a beautiful figure. Weight has always been a big deal to me. And that seed was planted, you know, growing up. I remember my first diet in first grade, tuna fish and mustard in a plastic container, you know, a few grapes on the side. And um, that's it. I'd have to take the money off my father's dresser, you know, the change, and I would eat school lunch. I'd eat the tuna fish mustard, pull out my change, have an ice cream sandwich, chocolate milk, the whole bit. My father, the first man who loves you, the first message about my weight is, Wendy, you have such a pretty face if you just lose some weight. I would get weighed constantly by my mother and father. One of Wendy's tricks, step on the scale, and then she would lean to one side so that yeah. the needle would move downward instead of upward. It might have been maybe too many mashed potatoes. I used to fight for Wendy when I was a kid. It's one thing to call her names, but there was one time one of the, one of the kids spit on her. I can't say it took a toll, but it was a burden. You know, Wendy definitely didn't like it. I knew. I knew that my mother would harp on her weight, and, you know, it, it wasn't comfortable for her. And Wendy would make herself throw up after dinner, and it would smell sometimes. And she, I would go in the room, and I'd say, oh, my God. Nobody else in the family knew what she was doing when she did that stuff, but she did it. My brother knew because he walked in on me, uh, but didn't stop me from doing it. I stopped doing that, I'll tell you why, because I was reading in either the Enquirer or the Star about some of these Hollywood actresses who had done that. I forget which one it was, but her teeth started to rot out. Now, I'm a toothnista, and I said, okay, this is not the way to go. Mm. I loved the tabloids, the National Enquirer, the Globe, the Star magazines, and that's where I was introduced to all this stuff you can get done to yourself. I'm like, well, now, hold on now. I'm going to get boobs, I'm going to get liposuction, and it's going to work for me. And then once I get to that weight, I'm not gaining anything back. And that'll be a part of what's on my list of, I'll show them. Oddly enough, Wendy never came home teary. She never came home angry in terms of what's this kid said and what that kid said. No. And for some reason, I guess Wendy just internalized the same thing. Oh, look. You know. But nor did she fight. No, no. Nor did no. she fight. No. Did she fight back? No. And stand up for she herself never, or say, you know, I'm was, not fat or I'm not tall. Or, Get out of here. Leave me alone. Yes. She didn't do that. No, no. There are things that are said or um, about her that, quite frankly, are just downright cruel. Wendy Williams is, is a, a monster. Because that thinks she's sexy. She's not. As a guy, you don't want your broad to be intimidating. She's Look too at her. big. Disgusting. She, she, she's just a monster. I think she's grown to have such an armor that says, I just have to move forward, that she doesn't let things affect her. Wendy, for me, is my sister, but she's the most resilient person I know. Well, when you share too much with people, then people get inside of your head with their opinion of what you're doing. And I don't like other people's opinions. I 
had very few people that I called friends. At a very early age, I just started to become my own best friend. And that's where radio comes in. Radio keeps you company. I would listen to Dan Ingram, Frankie Crocker, Harry Harrison. You know, I said, wow, this radio thing, huh? I like this. Some of these cool stories these people are telling. I had um, a cassette player and the microphone with that stupid string, and it would really record. And I said, come on, Tommy, let's play Rowing Reporter. Just act the part. And he said, do we have to? I said, yes, we do. You know, some of the things that she would say was like, what would you do if mommy and daddy would die? You know? And I'm like, I hate you right now. I've been nosy all of my life. I like it. <laughs> we all lived the realities of, of, of our lives. And Wendy was, you know, she had interest in what how other people were living. I wanted to do something where I could be fun and, and have an interesting glamorous life. I'm tall, I'm fat, I'm black. I can't wait to get out of this house, out of this town. I want to deliver on my own terms and make my mark on the world. It all worked out. And then Kevin came along. was on 
a station at that time that allowed her to, I guess, to interact with artists a little bit more. And then her personality really started to, to develop. There was a transition from Wendy, this naive girl, to a shock shock. You know, that was a transition. Like, it always wasn't like that. I think it was sort of like that, but it was, okay, now I understand that this works and I'm going to roll with it in my way. And that's what Wendy did. Nobody was really covering the dirt on the black artists like that. Who was having sex with who and who was doing this and who was doing that. What she says, how she can tease it and bring you into it. That's the talent. That's not something you could you, you could teach somebody to do. I don't want to be too graphic, but do you have that little nub that men must uh, please to turn women out? Oh, oh easy, <laughs> easy. <laughs> this black female celebrity tries to have an innocent image. In reality, she's a stone cold freak behind closed doors. I, I mean, this could be Halle Berry, but in my mind, I always picture her to be a cold fish. I love Jay. I just spoke to Jay this morning. How is Actually, the sex? Is he hung like a horse? Oh, God, you're unbelievable. She's going to be Wendy Williams, and nothing's going to stop that. I have brought her in my office many times. Wendy, did you say this? Wendy? You can't say that. Wendy, if you say that, we have to use the word allegedly. You can't accuse people of being that. Have you ever been pregnant? No. <laughs> I can't believe you just asked me that. No, well, you know. No, but I haven't. Uh, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. So. When, uh, when is the last time you had sex? Oh, yeah. my goodness. When is the last time you slobbed a knob? Oh, Wendy. I gotta tell you something. Look at this. Look at this. She kept me on the show just to ask the obscene questions. Listen, there are two people. We're elevating this show right no, now. No, I digress. I'm I mean, turn up. The consequences for me having a big mouth is that they didn't want to come to my radio show, but they would. Where are you going to go promote your music? I was number one. Wendy's always known if she's going to go for the deep question, sometimes she's going to offend people. And sometimes they're going to come back at her. I remember Whitney Houston's a good example. <laughs> that interview with Whitney Houston, was, I could listen to it over and over and over every day. She's running down the hallway in my office. Boss, you ain't going to believe what I got. I recorded Whitney Houston off the air. We went in the other studio in the production room and uh, we listened to the tape. Whitney, Whitney, Whitney. Wendy, Wendy, Wendy. I don't believe that I've ever met you in my entire career. Hey, that's something you talk about me all the time. She was being Wendy. She had asked questions that she knew the audience wanted wanted to know. And um, I give it a green light. Go ahead and air it. The conversation lasted for 28 minutes and had lots of peaks and valleys. But most of all, what I got from the conversation was a woman still in the grip in the struggle is there drug use going on at this present time who are you talking to whitney you know you're not talking to me i'm a mother hey my mother has privileged information ask me those questions like i'm a child wendy you truck me <laughs> 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 wendy 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 Nobody 
really understanding. That was an overwhelming time for me. Early in my radio career, there was this artist and he had the number one song on the R&B charts at the time. He came and did an interview on my radio show and he asked me out for dinner. So I said, yeah, you know, yeah. Then after that, he wanted to go change for his own party. And when we went to his hotel, he invited me to his room. And I went. And um, he goes in the bathroom to, you know, do whatever he does. When he comes out, he's got, like, nothing on. A pair of boxers. And I'm like, okay, what's about to happen? My dumb behind, instead of just getting up and walking out, I'm like... Okay, let me see how far this is going to go. I don't I don't want to have the sex. I don't, you know, I don't want to be involved with an artist. So he ended up pushing himself on me, and uh, he, he date raped me. And I left after that and went home and scrubbed my skin off, cried. That was that. I never told anybody. I, I just handled it, and uh, that's it. Why why do you choose not to name him? Can I? Right? Yeah, of course. No, I will name him. Name him. You want me to tell you his name? You want me to tell you his name? It's my story to tell. I know I could say his name, but you know what? I'll let him breathe, because he was a one-hit wonder. Thank God I am not dead or diseased. You know, if anything, it made me more focused and determined to move on with my life. And there's some days I'd be on uh, for eight hours again in New York. And that's how I gained my bones to be popular. And that's how I continued my hustle. And, that, and my boss is like that. And the only flaw that he had in me is that I was sniffing coke. I did overnights, which is the worst time on any radio station. It became... All right, you got to stay up. So I started doing a lot of coke. I mean, not a lot at times, but, you know, like a pile of Peru. That wasn't me. But I got high like five days a week. I did it <laughs> for years. It was no big deal. And uh, no big deal became a big deal. There was one particular night. I go to the bathroom, standing at the mirror, take my hit pass all the way out down to the ground my head hit the wall and i woke up there was nobody at the station i could have been dead or whatever like it's a miracle i'm sitting here now actually and then kevin came along kev had a major influence on wendy and part of that major influence is probably getting her to stop using kevin definitely um uh, he came around at the right time. I was about to be 30. I met Kevin on April 6th, 1994. And we met at a kitty skating rink where DJ Mr. C was doing the music. You know, at that time, we used to carry, like, big cases of records. And I had my mutual friend ask Kev to drive me around, and Kev used to start driving me around at parties. And I was DJing, and Wendy was the host. And one of his friends passed his number to me. He didn't even come over to me. This was not my first time at the rodeo, but there was something very civilized about him within the hood thing. I found it hustler hot. Rough around the edges, my type. <laughs> About two days later, I called Kev and I said, look, I get off at six. Here's the address. And he said, okay. And when I got done he picked me up, he smelled good, he looked good, he was cute, he was polite, he was on time right there at the radio station, and I saw the crisp in brand new clothes. You know how you know clothes have just been purchased? They have the creases. I was like, oh, he went all out. Okay. By the first traffic light, I knew I liked him. By the second traffic light, I knew I liked him. Um... Pardon me. By the time 
we crossed the Brooklyn Bridge, I was like, all right now, all right now, this is something special. We liked the same music, we liked the same food. He had a great sense of humor. I had the better sense of humor. I usually do. And that was that. Kevin and Wendy happened like fast, like Prior to her meeting Kevin, I never seen her with any man. I never seen her talking to a dude or being involved with anybody or anything like that. So when I seen Kevin corner her up, I just was like, what is happening over there? Immediately when Kevin and Wendy started seeing each other, Kev started promoting parties with himself, Wendy as the host, and me as the DJ. Play like 95 to like 97, we used to run New York. We would bring like Jay-Z there, Foxy Brown, Biggie, Junior Mafia. You know, we had a lot of fun with it. That whole run elevated all three of us. I think Kevin and Wendy met at the perfect time. I think they had a lot of bedroom talks of how they can just elevate and how they can just get bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, together we managed to build it and right, then July 13th, something's about, about to happen. Me. It's not about me. No, it's about me. It's, it's my show. I'm on the way. Show. I know I know how to play my position, even though I'm not a weak man. It's all cool. On our first or second date night, I told him I'm getting liposuction and breast implants, and I've already saved my money. Now, mind you, this is 1994, and I dared him on second or first date to say something different, because otherwise he would have been dismissed. I had my money. I'm not asking you for money. I'm not even telling you I love you, but I like you. And, and so, and away we go. And Kev did not protest. Uh, by early summer was my appointment, and I got done. <laughs> And I'll tell you, I, I care more about showing that than I do about whatever clothes I'm wearing. Like, I'm all about the body because it's flat, it's hard, and it has no stretch marks. I looked wonderful afterwards. I'm twerking, my boobs are poking. I am feeling like I'll show them, and I did. And Kev was along for the ride, and he, he really was a caring boyfriend at that time. He made me feel loved, comforted, and supported. You know, Kevin started to play such an important role in her life because Kevin became her protector. I remember one time I said something about Puffy's R&B group Total on the radio. Do you know the girl I'm talking about from Total? Right, right. right. Yeah, I, when, when I heard she was with Missy, I said, she's not committed to that. She's just <laughs> going for the paycheck. I guess they didn't like it. He didn't like it. Most people don't like it, but they're very entertained. I respect your hustle. Why don't you respect mine? Camera A and B, take one, Mark. Wendy was always saying stuff about us. It just seemed like she just had, she had it out for us. Like, how are you up here saying, told him some broke bitches, we grew up in the projects, never grew up in the projects. So I was like, yeah, I want to go Wendy up. You know what I'm saying? Like, nobody opposed. You know, Diddy didn't send us up there. I remember I got off the air one day, and them, them total bitches were downstairs waiting, and everybody upstairs at the radio station was looking down, egging it on, waiting for something to go down. Nobody put you on? Keisha, Kima, and Pam from Total jump out, boom, hit the sidewalk, and try to rush me. They were going to kick my ass. There was no security or anything. It was just them three fighting broads and me. Wendy was scared as hell. My brother taught me karate, so it's just like, you know, I, size don't mean nothing. We hopped out the car and was, like, trying to get at her like that. Out of nowhere, my knight in shining armor screeched up in his car. Didn't even know. I didn't even know what was about to happen. Next thing I know, he's out of the car and uh, there's a whole bunch of rah-rah going on outside. And I'm still trying to figure out what that was going on. Kevin protected her. We were like, all right, she wear her man. She gets in her Mercedes. She rolls the sunroof open and she sticks her little finger out the sunroof. And we're like, oh, when are you a punk ass? Like, you know, we just found that to be so funny. And that, I mean, and... But that was the end of it. It's not even like he, he knew. I just, it was just like weird. Another sign to say that this is the one for me. It became a point where Wendy wasn't getting all of her information from the Star or the National Enquirer. She was getting it from people on the streets. And uh, Wendy would go on the air with it. And so Kevin's street credibility came into play. I've had phone calls myself from artists threatening Wendy. And, you know... When I tell Kevin, he has a way of uh, making those problems disappear. 
when it comes to Wendy and when it came to Wendy during her business, he didn't care who you were. He didn't have wiggle room. He didn't believe in compromise. He had people shook. Oh, this feels so good. Oh my gosh, the massaging. Thank you, machine. <laughs> <laughs> what a mess. So, me and Kevin, we proceeded with our relationship. There was nothing impeding us. He didn't have children. I didn't have children. He was 23. I was 29. But his 23, based on all of the stuff he had seen being raised in Brownsville, Kevin was like 40. He had his place. I had my place. And that was the way it was. The good thing about Hot 97 is that no matter when you're on, you're down with the beats, you know? While I was in New York, I went through a tumultuous relationship with Hot 97. I left there and had to honor my non-compete clause. And my non-compete said, I can't work anywhere within, I think it was 80 miles of New York. And I got hired at Power 99 in uh, Philly. And Kevin waited patiently for me back here in New York, and we carried on with our relationship. Number one for the most hip-hop and R&B is Power 99 FM, Carter Sanborn and Wendy at 8.06 now. When I left New York, I was all that. And I knew, because everybody wants to be a Wendy, nobody could do a Wendy, and I could see it all around the country. There was a Wendy Jr. in every market. My thing was being mimicked everywhere. It is, it is human nature to want to know information about people, who you're sleeping with, whether it's a man or a woman, where you get your hair done, is it your hair, are your diamonds real, people want to know. We never had a personality like that in Philadelphia before, and a lot of people did not like her. Eve gave me a message to give you, okay. and the message was that she did not want to be on the air, she wanted you off the air. That's Eve's um, perspective. I quickly start to not like the bosses that I had. You know, I had a woman boss who told me I was a dinosaur, my old style. She told me that the first week I was there, I bawled like a baby and called my father after I got out of her office. Like, what is going, what is going on? What is going on? And no, I never did change my style because I can only be Wendy. Don't throw shade up here. This is, the, this is the Carter Sanborn and Wendy show. Before, they didn't know how to take her, you know? And she was so opposite of the people on the air with her. She didn't really blend with anybody. She just took over. When I got to Philly, Power 99 was number 14 in the city, and I took it to number one. While I was in Philly, me and Kevin, we're together, we're dating, but I wanted more. He didn't want to get married. He wasn't marriage-minded. He'd never seen a successful marriage. And I'm like, I'm not having that stupid wedding with that stupid, poofy dress. Thank God we were on the same page with that. But then I got pregnant, um, and things changed. Motherhood was something that she wanted. I think something that she needed. Um, and probably the most important thing in the world to her, even now. Family has always been at the top of Wendy's list. No matter how others feel, or how others have projected Wendy or thought about her as, you know, maybe going out to a party or something. Now, family has always been at the top of Wendy's list. I know that as her mother. She was excited about being pregnant. She shared it with everybody like she does everything else. You know, I'm pregnant, about to have this baby. She would take the listeners through the hospital visits, and this happened this day, this happened that day. Then we had a five-month miscarriage, and that was devastating. My mother found me collapsed in the room on the floor, and I mean, I was absolutely wailing. She sat down, she rubbed my hair on the floor with me. She had a very difficult time holding the baby. And um, it was very heartbreaking to her. It was very, very heartbreaking that she was not able to have a normal pregnancy. Kevin came to me and said, look, marry me. It's God's plan. And I said, yeah, let's get married. We secured a marriage license at the Justice of the Peace, and I didn't tell my family until after it was done. So after we got married, life was good, and we still wanted to have a baby, so I got pregnant again. We were together, and I wheeled her around Babies or Us, and we picked out all the little stuff that she was going to need. While we were out that day, and I recall very distinctly, she complained that her stomach was feeling a little odd. And she called me that night, and she said, I'm going to the hospital. Something is wrong. 
the entire city saw me have two five-month miscarriages and I was out doing public appearances with a burgeoning belly and I had to deliver the babies like with that epidural and the push, push, push. And the nurses, they said, do you want to know if it's a boy or a girl? I said, no, no. Do you want a funeral or what do you want? I said, just go. Just, just go. I just remember that it became so difficult because there was that feeling of, am I ever going to be able to do this? God is punishing me, you know, for talking about people. There were all of these philosophical reasons why she felt it was happening. There was extreme sadness and uh, resilience. You know, the resilience to be able to bounce back. And I get emotional when I think about it um, because I don't know too many people who could go through what she went through back then. Not only did it take a toll on her personally, it took a toll on, you know, the dynamic of her marriage. At one point, she wanted to end the marriage because she didn't feel as though she was woman enough for her husband because she couldn't, you know, bear him a child. Kevin, you know, he was very reassuring, saying, look, we don't need a kid. But when you didn't want to hear that, you could see her sometimes come in and she was just broken down. The people relate to me so much. Well, you know. I mean, Tanya, it's just real living. When she was going through her miscarriages, the fans were very empathetic toward her. That's when the dynamic changed in terms of people, you know, not particularly caring for her to loving her. After my second five-month miscarriage, we finally got successfully pregnant with young Kevin. I wasn't scared. You know, I got pregnant again, but this time I told my radio station I want to stay on bed rest, you know, the whole time. And I, my, my bosses were ass. They were like, oh, really? I said, yes. I've been working for you all this time. I had two five-month miscarriages. They were like, oh, okay, well, we'll put the equipment in your house. I was like, gee, thank you. We had all the engineers bring all the equipment to her home. And, uh... She did it from bed. Even though I was pregnant, I kept the show running. It was fine. It was fine. And boom. Through determination, we had Kev. Ah, being mother's everything I wanted to be. Now I'm a wife and a mother in what I think is a successful relationship. Dear Wendy, need your advice. I'm 32 years old and I have a husband of nine years and one child and one on the way. But he's not the father. Wendy, I need your help. Sandra, you're in too deep for my help. I don't know what you want me to do. Cheating is for suckers, and having a baby by is for the real suckers. I wake up like 2 o'clock in the morning to go to the bathroom. I just delivered him two months ago, and Big Kev wasn't in the bed. And then I walked into young Kev's nursery to, you know, my baby. And I hear my husband talking, greasing on the phone in one of the guest rooms. He was clearly talking to a girl. And then I lose it and jump into the room. I say, what's going on? He told me it was some girl, some bank teller he met at a bank. He's ending it and so on and so forth. And I honestly believe that. This is my husband. And we had a baby. And I don't know how to be a mother. What do I do with this? I wanted this, but what do I do now? You're not going to leave me alone. Hold on. Let me just straighten up. Okay. Okay. Camera guys. This is so disgusting. Let me just get myself together. So disgusting. He was cheating on me. And we had a baby. And I don't know how to be a mother. What do I do with this? I wanted this, but what do I do now? I just said, all right, well, this is love. I will not divorce. This is a mistake. So I was very much isolated in terms of that revelation. I had gotten another le level of plastic surgery. <laughs> I got my tummy tuck. My breasts were still sitting good. I got a little more liposuction. I had this beautiful baby boy. I had already been cheated on by Kevin. I was done with being a partner 
at Philly, which great market. I think it's market number five, but I don't want to be number five. I want to be number one. I want to reclaim my crown. I knew that the fire that Wendy left was really never duplicated. And there was a thirst, an appetite, and a certain energy that needed to be satisfied with bringing her back. So I called Vinny and said to him, Vinny, I want to come home. And so we met later on that. And so we met later on that week at the assigned exit on the turnpike. A week later, I had a contract. But I told Kevin to make Kevin feel good about the call that he would make to Vinny, you know, to chop it up and talk about how much money and, you know, when's Wendy going to start and make Kevin think that he's the one that arranged it all. Kevin does not know that that's how I got back to New York. I'm telling this story for the first time uh, publicly. <laughs> You've got to have a plan. So I left Philly and came back to New York where I obtained my own employment. I was ready to come home. Paris Hilton, Little Kim's verdict comes in today. We'll talk about Ruben Stutter, Mariah Carey, Kelly Ripa, ground zero for pop culture. Thanks everybody for being here today. The impact that she had when she returned to New York, it was just overwhelming. We cut a couple of promos and ran it. The phones rang off the hook. He was on the radio live and I and, and I damn near freaked out. Oh my god. Welcome back. Well, it's very nice to be here. Thank you. I got this brand new baby. This husband that I think we're gonna make it. Hit that microphone and lit it up. Usher's wife. We know the word on the street regarding that marriage well, and what it's all about. I was drunk. A mouth is a mouth. A hole is a hole sometimes. <laughs> Kevin was in the picture during the BLS days. Uh, each time something uh, really important needed to be done, she would uh, defer me to Kevin. I respected that. Usher, husband, manager. Whatever, uh, sure, yeah, I'll discuss it with him. And uh, I never really had a problem. Sometimes he's a little overzealous with, with some things. Kevin was definitely checking out who was already in Wendy's circle. He was definitely being assertive as to who he thought she should be around. Kevin wanted me to continue working with Wendy and do parties with her. Kevin came to me and like, yo, we're going to continue doing this thing. I was like, Kev, I can't do it. Like, contractually, I can't do it. And Kev was pissed off. He just took it like it was a war. I mean, he took it like I was going up against him. Even if he never verbally said to Wendy, don't speak to C no more, Wendy is going to take Kevin's side, which is understandable. And I understood the rules when they stopped speaking to me. I understood the rules that this is what it was. Any time that Kevin gave her opinion, she would just listen. I think at the back of her mind, she knew what the answer was going to be, but she would definitely appease him. Meaning, okay, so maybe I won't be seen too much with that person or in public with that person too much. I think he started to think he was indispensable, that she wasn't going to be able to get on without him. I think he was trying to isolate her because he didn't trust anybody in the industry, you know, and he just thought that everybody was out to get her uh, very controlling, very controlling. You know, you're a girl from the suburbs, you don't know nothing. You know, business-wise, Kevin had a way of cutting people off in mid-sentence. Bosses, their bosses, and their bosses. You know, when Kevin was nice, he's lovely. But when he's mad, mean, or things don't go his way, he's the worst. Now, in the music industry and in the radio industry, Kevin Hunter was feared. Very feared. But he was doing everything that he could do to get the best for Wendy. We have a security force on the show, but there's one particular person who's always assigned particularly to me, and that person comes out to appearances and leaves the building with me and things like that. His name is James. James was dismissed from not just me one-on-one, -on -one, but from doing security on my show because Kev thought we were getting too close, which is a lie. Like, you got so much going on in your life you want to accuse me of anything and everything and methodically make me look like I'm out of control? Please, get out of here with that. I'm sorry I can't be that girl. You know, you met me as a boss. And, 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 and I don't bring that boss thing inside. And anybody who knows me knows I am soft and pink. The 
way I'm talking to you right now is only out of anger. I'm like a porcupine. You know how they keep all those prickles down? But when times get tough, they put those prickles up, and if you jump on them, you get stabbed to death. I'll show them. I'll show them. In my marriage, I was very naive in believing in love and just, you know, three o'clock in the morning, he's not home. Pat, 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 he's not home. But I knew that he had a condo where he'd hang out with his friends. They'd drink brown liquor and smoke blunts. And if I don't want that in my home, my beautiful home with my beautiful baby boy, this is a proper neighborhood. Get out of here with all that street hood mess. So for him to have a place, I never questioned it. When Kevin first got the condo, you know, it was nice. And I opened up a, a night table drawer and saw a Rolex watch. And I said, ah, whose watch is this? And he said, um, I was buying that for you. I said, you're lying. Who's the bitch? You know, and I pulled the covers back real hard. Yeah, they were underwear that don't fit me in the bed. And the bed sheets were nasty. It was the party house. And everybody knew. And whenever I went around Kevin's people, they could never look me in the eye. And I knew it was always out of guilt. And I would always insist that they look, look me in the eye. Why are, you, why are you looking down? You don't think I know? Look, look me in the eye. Kevin was perceived as a bully. He had everybody on the edge when he walked in. Nobody didn't want him in the building. Kevin was, he was loud. He was loud. Whether it was an angry loud, a happy loud, it was just always loud. It was very abrasive. Have I seen testimonies between Kevin and Wendy? Absolutely. He would come to the job sometimes and they were going to another room. You could see them through a glass, you know, having a, a disagreement or argument. There was a fine line between wife and performer. The conversation I had to have with Kevin is, Wendy is your wife, I respect that. But when she's in this radio station, she's my jock. And I can't have you arguing with her about something while she's performing on the air. I didn't see anybody getting their head bashed in, you know, punched and all that type of stuff. I didn't see that. But um, it got very, very tense at times. Uh, yeah, that, uh, that was a little off-putting. And then there was a long period of time where Kevin was banned from the radio station because he wasn't just bullying or abusing Wendy. He was abusing station management. They said, y y you're no longer allowed upstairs. So, you know, he didn't push back. He just didn't come. And so whenever he needed something done, he would just call me. You know, I'd be upstairs and he'd say, you know, I need you to do such and such. You know, put Wendy on the phone. The people around me were very loyal to me, not because I asked them to be, but because, you know, I'm nice and I'm hardworking and I'm charming and I'm fair. So they put up with Kevin because I'm talented and I'm worth it. I think I became desensitized to it because Wendy didn't make it seem like it was a big deal. The way she would bounce back from it, like nothing ever happened. Like, that's Kevin being Kevin. All right, put the mic up, Art. Hey, this is Wendy Williams, WBLS 104.7.5, and go right into her thing again. It never affected her when the mic was on, but when the mic was off, you know, you, you, felt, you felt what she was going through. You felt her pain. There's a genius to that. There's almost a built-in, like, she's her own therapist in many ways because she's able to put things in boxes and be okay with them until she's not. At her core, she's really good at telling stories and weaving tales, even to herself. So I think she's maybe didn't see a problem. You could assume that he's a woman beater. Kevin's not a woman beater. I was an emotionally abused woman, and I was taken advantage of horrifically. And I was very naive in believing in love and just, you know, you understand what I'm saying? Kev can be accused of a lot of things, but he's not a, a woman beater. He's just a weird man with a whole bunch of issues that I'm glad I'm rid of. Because I wasn't a battered woman. You know, I, I don't remember that. You know, Kevin never punched me in the arm. You know, I, you know I, I fell and broke my arm on my own. 
You understand what I'm saying? Kevin never beat me. When I got my TV show, I remember the day I was having a meeting with, you know, some of my producers in my office. And if you've ever seen my office on the after show, it's, it's beautiful and it's cluttered and it's full of really good glamorous stuff. And I really enjoy it in there. And, and, and so we're meeting and, and Kev normally didn't like me to start the producers meetings until he got there. And he'd be very emphatic about that. But he was like 20 minutes late. And finally I said, let's start now. We got to get the show started on time. I don't know where Kev is. He wasn't answering his phone. Like Kev doesn't. He, he. So we're going over hot topics in the segments of the show. And Kev comes in the office and has a bag from the jewelers. Another watch. So I'm like, okay, this is really nice, but can you sit down so we can get to this meeting? Thank you very much for that. He smacked it down on the table in front of everybody and fractured my table. I had to literally order a whole new panel. I have witnesses to that. As if I wasn't celebrating him walking in late and giving me a Rolex watch. I have Rolexes. I have everything. I don't need more. Stuff is stuff. We have been given an opportunity. We got over 100 people relying on us. I did, when I was at Disney and I was running Buena Vista Television, we did a pilot with Wendy, and that was back in like the mid-90s. Thank you everybody for tuning in to my first television show. I want to cry, but I don't want to ruin my makeup. You know, most of these talk shows that are out there, you have to kind of say, why am I watching it, right? And Wendy, you want to hear what she has to say. And about two weeks later, I found out that the talk show was not going to be picked up. In the meantime, I had spent about a week during that two week waiting time, you know, I got a talk show. Worst thing I could have done. And then in early 08, we heard her on the radio in New York and we thought she had a voice that kind of made sense. And so we approached her and her husband about the possibility of doing a talk show. The idea there was, what if we put this show on for five, six weeks in the summer and see what it did? We really didn't do much rehearsal. We pretty much just jumped in. And she she was great from day one. Me and Kevin celebrated. But even when you get the next big thing, the best way to show people hmm, is to show them. It's very interesting that you've kind of switched it up for the, t the talk show. I'd love to Not see really. more of the I edge. These people, I'd love to see more of the edge. edge. I'm singing a, a softer side of maybe you're evolving. I like that. Maybe you're evolving. No, this is the same Wendy. I, I'm just giving more. When I first saw her, I was like, oh, they sort of like tamed her tamed her down just a bit. No, I know how to chill, okay. but I will not be disrespected. Amorosa came out nasty, angry, and Wendy, at the, in the beginning, she was just taking it all in, taking it all in, and all of a sudden, I could see it click. She even said, okay. Okay. <laughs> I think she thought, okay, this is how this is gonna roll. This is not the time for you to look for your moment. I invited you here. Oh, I know how to find my moment. Which is I understand. Roll the book. We're gonna Let's talk switch. about the book. All right, well, let's get to it, Wendy. As time went on, you started to see that, you know, she was a little more aggressive. Thank you for coming on my Thank show. You. It was really the beginning of our show. Her whole years of radio training taught her how to do TV. The only difference is that she's in front of a camera. Dear Wendy. <laughs> already an Oprah, then there's a Wendy doing it her way. Maybe she does it with a teaspoon of ratchet. <laughs> Oprah was of the people like Wendy is. I think it's probably closer to Howard Stern. You know, not exactly the same, but in style and tone some way. She says what people are thinking but are afraid to say. Are you having sex? <laughs> she makes her audience feel like uh, they're in her living room and she's talking to them. I don't know anyone who is as much of a pop culture expert as Wendy Williams. You lean in when you're watching her. What happened yesterday? Tell me. She's like the black Jessica Rabbit with lots of opinions. She totally stands by everything she says, whether it is that crazy or not. I think that Kanye and Kim need to have a meeting. And what Kanye needs to do as a man and stop being a diva. Kevin was her manager and one of the exec producers of the show. 
and it was pretty volatile. To be honest, as one of the two guys that runs the company, we were partly in denial and partly just hoping it just would be okay. And she was still showing up every day, and the show was still good. I would have to grab Wendy for rehearsal. We'd come to the floor. We'd go through a couple times, and Kevin would come out and, you know, do his posturing and, and, and would literally grab her off the floor if he was unpleased. He'd be like, all right, that's it. Rehearsals are done. I'm taking her. He was hell-bent on keeping her from truly being herself. He had to keep some sort of control over her all the time. They were a package deal since day one, and it was very clear. They relied on each other throughout the years, I guess, that obviously crumbled. I was just all, you know, sunshine and lollipops at that point with new life. Forget the past mistakes. Let's move on. But there was something very weird going on. I heard buzzings and rumblings and, a, you know, I hired a PI. Yes, I did. Low and slow. Follow him. I found a whole lot of stuff. I'm feeling good. People at my own show call me boss. And me and Kev, I thought, were on the same page. But Kevin had gone to L.A. for business. And I hired a P.I. Yes, I did. I hired a P.I. to follow my husband. And this guy is telling me that Kevin is in Miami with the girl. This is where you show the picture of them on the beach. You know the picture where she's going to the camera, and he's laying there on the cell phone like they're chilling like a couple. You understand what I'm saying? Sharon, let me introduce Sharina to Kevin because they are both from South Carolina, and they were at some type of a function, and then he made the introduction, and initially, she was attracted to someone else. But, you know, Kevin instantly kind of had his eye zeroed in on her. Charlemagne didn't introduce Sharina for the purpose of getting that close with Kevin, though. And Kevin, so stupid, what a stupid gorilla. The P.I. was taking pictures of them going to the gym, going to dinner, her with Gucci, Poochie, and Lucci. And I was Googling, and I'm seeing all, the, like, the Daily Mail did an excellent job. Like, bloggers were doing a great job. And so, you know... This backwards Barbie, uh, you know, he was tricking up money. She's in the passenger seat of my Rolls Royce Ferrari. And, you know, I mean, really? Really? And our son's in Miami. So I have to be calm on the phone with him, you know, like a loving mother. I have to be happy on the TV every morning live from New York. <laughs> We're doing Hot Topics and being a Hot Topic. It's some sort of weird story going around the internet regarding my husband. The headlines were everywhere. The tabloids, the newspapers, credible news sources were talking about this affair. Now look, I'm a straight shooter, pow pow. All you gotta do is Google him and you see the story. You can believe what you want, but... to assume that she was having something of an existential crisis where she was like, how am I not talking about this, but I can't because I have a son and I'm ashamed and embarrassed. I had nobody again to talk to, but the times now were even deeper than they ever were in my life. I couldn't call my mom, my dad, my sister. They would have just said, just leave, just leave. And I'm like, ah, but I'm still in love. I don't know what to do. Like, are you serious with this? This is really going down. This is going down. It was you all with the drone and, and took a picture. And I read about it in the blogs and the tabloids, the address of this place that he had purchased to share with this backwoods bitch nine miles from my house in Livingston. And they're living the high life. She probably knew before the tabloids put it out. As a woman, you, with your husband for X amount of years, you know when they're cheating. I went to the house, a beautiful house with a three-car garage. I was cupping my eyes at every window. Oh, hmm, 
Okay, not in my house, but this is a good come up for a 32 year old woman who's been involved with my husband for over 10 years. Pulled out my spray paint. <laughs> And I spray painted Kevin and Wendy forever. And to this day, it still is forever. Doesn't mean I love you. Not like that. Love don't live here anymore. And I had my Gorilla Glue, which is fabulous. And I glued the mailbox closed with the Gorilla Glue. <laughs> and I spray painted pink all over it. And I'm just crying and having a good old time in my own head saying, all right, Wendy, you've always been strong. Girl, this is your time. You gotta get this mess together. You got a hit show. You got a beautiful son. What do you do when you find out your marriage is about to be all the way over? Hmm. said, would you be willing to come on the Halloween show and do some outfits? And I was like, absolutely. I'm so sorry, Wendy. Can you get fresh from here? I'm just kidding. I'm a shady cameraman. Get on these lips. There was a little monitor um, next to where I was ripping off my dress, and Wendy was introducing something, and I looked up at the monitor. I stand within 10 feet of her, and I thought something's not right with her. Our first caress. <laughs> you can't just run out and be like, stop, everybody stop, Wendy's not okay. I was watching on the monitor and Wendy just dropped out of frame and it was really frightening. I passed out on my own show on Halloween. I didn't want to say to anybody, you know, cut. I knew I could have, but I didn't want to disappoint. The story of my life. <laughs> in the building up in his office. He raced downstairs and he scooped me up like a damsel in distress. And somehow in my stupid mind, when Kevin rescued me, I said, you know what? This is all gonna work out. People make mistakes. And Kevin said, you know, baby, I know you can do it. Go back out there and show them what you're made of. Close out the show. I said, I know, right? A stunt. I'm overheated in my costume and I did pass out. But you know what? I'm a champ and I'm back. Wendy got up, maybe put some powder on in her makeup room, I don't know, and walked right back out there and finished the show. I mean, that's Wendy. We didn't know what was going on. We were worried about her and it was scary. People were panicked about me. And although I passed out, I knew there was a bigger situation of the situation. Like, what am I going to do? I have a career for over three decades talking about people and now I'm being talked about. She fainted in she, the costume. Yeah. It's like she knows something's wrong. Yeah. She can't try, she yeah. can't figure out what it is. Yeah. And she can't articulate it. I'm doing hot topics and now I am a hot topic. I didn't even think it was unfair. I thought it was very fair. It's just very awkward, but very fair. Why not? I don't blame tabloids. I don't blame blogs. I blame him. I don't even blame her. In November, a black Porsche drove in my driveway to do a K-turn. It slowed down and just happens I was home. And I was at a particular window where I could see. It was a woman who was with a burgeoning belly. And I could see that because the way our house is pitched, it's on a little bit of a hill. And this person, her, was taking pictures of our home. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm saying this. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Then she backs out. She reverses the car to go back to where she came from. At that point, I can't believe what my life is about to turn into. The state of the couple's union has been under the microscope in recent months. I did hear about when Kevin's girlfriend was pregnant. 
I feel bad for Wendy. I knew that he wasn't using condoms all the time. She's going to get pap smears and pregnancy and ultrasounds, and thank God my area is still ready for the next man. I've got nothing. And he's got a baby. Damn. I remember Wendy saying a long time ago, and it's always stayed with her, that she could forgive an affair. But an affair with a baby, that's it. So what do you do? When you've had a stellar career, you come from a fine family. When your beautiful gift from God is away in Miami at college, you open the wine. Rock back and forth, you watch TV, you sit and think, you don't get on the phone. I don't want anything interrupting my thought pattern. I'm just waiting for him to come home. I'll wait. Like six hours later, it'll be two bottles in. By myself, that's right now. <laughs> what would you do? He comes home. And I went ham. And he tried to deny. And I went hammer. And then opened another bottle of wine. And I went hamish. And I had no reason to lower my voice or not rock my neck. Because my son's away in college. There's nobody there for me to, you know, try to shelter my voice from. That had me feeling bad for Wendy. I mean, you gotta be devastating. I know her first thoughts was probably, what is little Kevin thinking about all of this? I can take Kevin hurting me. What I can't take is how is it affecting my son. This is a culmination of everything. Everything, everything. <laughs> and, um... I am, like, screaming like a raving lunatic. And what would you do? What would you do? <gasps> there was nobody for me to call for a second opinion. There was nobody to call. My alcohol blood level was probably zero to... Uh, <laughs> wow. You understand what I'm saying? It's got to be weird for her that she's a hot topic. Yes, she does go on TV and talk about other people's stuff. And now she has to talk about herself. But she has to. She'd lose her credibility if she didn't. And she knows that. For those of you caught up in the struggle of addiction, well, for some time now, and even today and beyond, I have been living in... A sober house. Yeah, I said it on a talk show. I'm living in sober community. You know, I said that because the paparazzi was already following me. After I turn the world on with my smile and have staff meetings and then sneak and read my papers and get on the Google or Schmoogler and see what the blogs are saying now about the messiness that has been created around me. Driven back to the halfway house by these horrible people, horrible, who would want to have conversations with me. So how are you feeling? How do you think I'm feeling? The phone lines did not work in my office, and it took me a while to find out that that's because the phone lines were removed because they did not want me talking to the outside world. There's no TV, there's no windows in my room. I'm in a gray walled room by myself. You know, they would flip my match, go through my stuff. When I was there, when I wasn't, a wig and shake it down, looking for drugs and stuff. Hi, I'm Wendy, I'm an addict. In the meantime, pick a finger and get me out of here. She was throwing stones for years and years, and now the house is falling around her, and everyone's seeing the pictures of the mistress down the street who's pregnant and the car that she's getting. And it was making me mad as a Wendy fan. I was like, I wanted her to come out on the show and talk about it. I thought that she owed it to her viewers after she had been bringing out everybody's dirty business for so long. I admitted that I was in a sober house, whatever you call it, and had you thinking something about me that I wasn't. I'm not an addict. Well, I'm confused. I really don't like the way I feel today, but I'm confused about something, and I'm going to share the honesty. It's hard not to talk about it, right? Because you're going to read about it. Your boss is in the paper, and at some point, she has to address it. 
She has to. She now becomes the hot topic. It's hard to say give privacy because I don't give privacy when I'm doing the rest of the stories. I am um, working on my divorce. I got to tell you something right now. As a mature single, I'm a single woman. You know what I'm saying?
feature on the show now, and when he comes out, it's looking real good. Sparkle in her eye. It's really touching. It's really special. It makes us really appreciate her. I think when we first sat with her after her divorce, after she filed for divorce and she was on her own, she sort of took responsibility for whatever had happened in the past and said, I can't change what happened. Here's what I want to do. If you want to do it, that's great. If you don't, no hard feelings. Let's move on. I have the ultimate bachelorette pad high atop everything. I have a really, really good view and I'm really, really reclaiming my life. Of course, nobody is perfect. As I told Wendy, no, you're not going to be perfect. Nobody's going to be perfect. There is no perfect. Perfect, I'm afraid, is not for this world. But the process in trying to get there can be very enjoyable. She's still standing, as they say, in athletics. Still standing. I'm here. She had a period where she had to find her sea legs. She told me a story on the radio about flying alone for the first time. And there was something heartbreaking about it but then on the other hand there was something really empowering and beautiful about it so you know i, I hope that that period is just a, a distant memory and it's all you know she's just doing her own thing now the elephant in the room is that i've been having a very very tough year but it is it is so it's slowly but surely i'm climbing out of uh the pit and this is one of those monumental days that makes me say you know if you don't believe in yourself who's gonna believe in you from a black standpoint she definitely made her mark it's not only becoming a new york radio legend but becoming a national tv talk show legend you know i don't know if it's gonna be matched i don't know if somebody can match that i want to give some love to my son kevin he's only 19 so he only knows me as doing this i've been behind a microphone for over 30 years of my life now so he only knows mom up here somehow he always tells me that i'm still just mom you know you know there's no place like home right this will either make or break her this period that she's in right now and how she comes out of it. Will she rise like the phoenix that she always has done? Today, Hollywood honors Wendy Williams. Her career in media has spent more than 30 years. People will remember her as a singular uh, and original talent. That she does what other people can't do. She's good. She's trying to say, hey, you, you don't have to be the popular kid. You just have to have hopes and dreams and then just stay with it. I think she would love for that to be her legacy. Well, in the end, they were wrong, you know, trying to shut me down and have me obey all the rules. You don't meet a lot of people who um, authentically are themselves and willing to take risks and chance. And I happen to be one of those weirdos. <laughs> And I happen to be one of those weirdos. <laughs>